yield the remainder of my time to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. I thank the uh, chairman uh, for his remarks. And I, I'm just gonna follow up, um, Judge, with the question of the, well, you and I came to agreement about the numbers of 55,000 roughly that had been encountered in December in the El Paso sector, uh, some 200 and, I can't remember the exact number, uh, I'm sorry, 145 or 50,000 encountered over the, over the uh, fiscal year, the three months. How, how many of those encountered have been turned away under Title 42? Have been what? Ex how many of those have been turned away under Title 42? With respect to the, I'm, I'm not sure of that number, but that's, I think from the Border Patrol, they're looking at about 35 percent. Yeah, that that that, mean, that tracks with with the numbers that I understand, right? So you're talking about of the 55,000, you'd have 18 to 20,000 that would have been turned away under Title 42. You have 15 that you'd have about 50,000 of those 150,000 would have been turned away under Title 42. Uh, yet we know that there was a situation in El Paso with the difficulty of dealing with the processing of the numbers. We now we've got busing going on across the country. Like, what happens if Title 42 is no longer being enforced? Well, I think you're, you're doing the right thing because, as you know, it was a public health mandate. It had nothing to do with migration. And if, I think if you want to figure out and get to the problem, uh, th that was very confusing because it had to do with something totally different that is now being utilized. I think it's, to me, I think we, the reason we would lift it is because we, we can continue the process and do it properly, and you're not gonna have all of these other individuals that are trying to cross illegally because that's their only way to get here. Because well, I've said over and over that there's a lot of them that have been stuck in the middle, that they came thinking that Title 42 was gonna be lifted, and when it wasn't lifted, then they fell into this desperation. And, and, and that's, I, I believe, and I've said so, it over and over, that so, we so Judge, the, and I'm, I'm running out of time, and I'm sorry, sure. I, I, I don't want to, we just have limits on time. No, go ahead. I, I would say to you that uh, what you just described is all in the context of border security. It's all in the context of who comes in and who doesn't, right? Which is, which is what border security is. So there have been some who have been critical of saying that we should enforce our existing laws with respect to That's asylum true. laws. Asylum laws which require detention. That's what our current laws require, detention while you make a determination, right? A determination of credible fear for persecution under our asylum laws, which is a smaller number than the number of people who are coming that would qualify. And so we're saying we should detain in order to make those determinations. The connection to Title 42 is really important because the current administration is even in all of its bluster about Title 42, still defending the law in court because they know what happens when Title 42 goes away. And what you just described is really important for the American people to understand. You just described it in the context of border security, not the context of COVID and a pandemic because it has been being used as a border security band-aid. And what we must do as a body is embrace policy changes to ensure we can effectuate management of the flow while respecting our laws with respect to asylum, which is precisely what House Republicans are putting forward, notwithstanding the allegations of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And I'm over my time, I yield back. 